So in discipleship class number 13, we're going to cover the study on angels, angels. So angels in the Bible does not mean messenger. If you look at Hebrews chapter 1, verse 13 through uh, 14, not all the time the Bible says messenger, although at times they do give a message, but it's not all the time. So let's look, uh, we're going to look at that one verse, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 13 through 14 right here. Mostly people say that angels means messengers, but not all the time do they. In Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 13 through 14, the word of God describes the angels as right here. But to which of the angels said he at any time, sit on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? So we see right here that the angels, what they do is that they minister to the children of God. They do minister to the children of God. Uh, sometimes what they are represented as is appearance, appearance, and they connect them to the stars, which is interesting. But we won't go over that. We're just going to cover some basic doctrines. So Hebrews 1, 13 through 14 gives a good intro on angels. All right, the next thing about angels that we're going to look at is the nature of angels, the nature of angels. Now, the nature of angels, what kind of beings they are and what they do throughout the Bible, is that they can enter locked prison doors at Acts chapter 12, verse 7. They open prison doors at Acts chapter 5, verse 19. They ascend in a flame at Judges chapter 13, verse 19 and 20. They travel great distances in great speed at Daniel chapter 10, verse 12 to 13. They are wiser than men, so they're very smart beings. That's found in 2 Samuel chapter 14, verse 20. They are also known to be very strong at Psalms chapter 103, verse 20. In fact, uh, here, specific examples of their strength is definitely like Superman. At 2 Kings 19, verse 35, 2 Samuel 24, verse 15 through 16, and Matthew chapter 28, verse 2 through 4. The angel can roll the 100-pound stone away, an angel can kill uh, thousands of men in one night, thousands of soldiers. They are also immortal at Luke chapter 20, verse 35 through 36. They have no blood, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 50. A lot of churches don't teach you that, not, e not even independent fundamental Baptists. So this is a new thing that you might want to know. They are also very innumerable, Revelation 5.11, Hebrews 12.22, Matthew 26, 53, 2 Kings 6, 17. They are also known to be holy, Mark 8, 38. That's why they can be in heaven, unlike humans. Now, the names of angels, the names of angels. What are the names of these angels? Well, you're going to find out that, one, they're called sons of God, sons of God. You'd be surprised how many churches do not even know that basic they think that sons of God is referring only to saints, but that's not true. They are also, uh, what they are referring to is angels many times throughout the Bible. That's found at Psalms 148, verse 2, Job 38, verse 7, Job chapter 2, verse 1, Matthew chapter 18, verse 10, and Daniel chapter 3, verse 25 and 28. They're also known to be called morning stars, morning stars. So they're known as sons of God. And they're also known to be morning stars. Why are they morning stars? Because the Bible says in Revelation 1, verse 20, angels are represented as stars. Revelation chapter 9, verse 1 as well. Revelation chapter 12, verse 4, and verse 9. All right, now the work of angels. What do angels do? The work of angels, what they do throughout the Bible, is that they honor, worship, and serve God. They honor, worship, and serve God, which is found at Revelation 5, verse 11 through 12, chapter 8, verse 3 through 4. They run errands on earth. They run errands on earth. And you can find that throughout the whole Bible, what they do on the earth, dealing with people. They also exercise God's judgment. Acts chapter 12, verse 23, Matthew 13, 41, Numbers 22, 22. They guide believers. They guide believers at Acts chapter 8, verse 26. 
They assist, protect, and strengthen believers. Daniel 6.22, Matthew 4.11, Luke 22.43. They accompany our Lord when he returns. That's found in Matthew 25.31, 2 Thessalonians 1, verse 7 through 8. They take the Lord's children to heaven at death. So if you all didn't know that, that's found in Luke chapter 16, verse 22. When you die, angels carry you. They had a part in giving the law. So it's not just God who gave the law to Moses. Angels also had a part in it. That's found in Acts 7.53, Galatians 3.19. All right, here's a deeper part. We're going to cover the sex and the age of angels. Angels, they are never female. They are always male. The age of the angels would be probably around 33 and a half years old. The reason why is this. Matthew chapter 22, verse 30 shows that they are not allowed to marry. They are single, the angels. In Genesis chapter 6, verse 1 through 2 and verse 4, however, the sons of God, they can marry and they can bear children. Okay, why is that? Well, Matthew 22, 30 shows they're not allowed in heaven. So when they were on earth, something happened. Now remember 1 Corinthians 15, 50, on the nature of angels is that they are bloodless. They do not have blood. So what they did then is that it is said that they may have taken it orally somehow. They probably took it orally. Thus you get mythology about vampires and aliens from Mars sucking the blood of humans. Where did they get those ideas from? <laughs> Use your imagination. All right. Uh, the sons of God are not the children of Cain. That's important to understand at Genesis 6. Schofield made that mistake, as well as many independent fundamental Baptists. Uh, they are men, never women. That's proven at Genesis 19, verse 1 and verse 5, as well as Judges chapter 13, verse 6. Now, where do you get the idea that they are 33 and a half year old males? And they have such bodies as a 33 and a half year old male. The reason why is this. In Acts chapter 27 verse 23 and Galatians chapter 4 verse 14, the angel is as Jesus Christ. He's like Jesus Christ. Now remember, when Jesus Christ went back to heaven, what kind of body did he go up when he went back to heaven? How old was he? He was 33 and a half years old. That's found at Luke chapter 3, verse 23. He was 30 years old when he started his ministry. Since then, his ministry lasted three and a half years to the crucifixion and resurrection. And this is proven at John chapter 2, verse 23, John chapter 6, verse 4, and John chapter 11, verse 55 through 57. He attended three Passover feasts. On the third and final Passover feast, which is once a year, that's when he died. So he was 33 and a half approximately that time. So if the angel, if Jesus Christ is 33 and a half years old when he be went back to heaven, so right now he has a 33 and a half year old body. And remember, the angels are like Jesus. Thus, they have 33 and a half year old bodies. But that's why it makes more sense why we, when we got saved, became sons of God and we're going to be like Jesus Christ when we get raptured to heaven. See, all of this is connected. We're all going to be 33 and a half. All right, the superiority of men over angels. Now, that's amazing. These angels are supposed to be superior than the men. But men have the superiority. Why? Because 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 3 shows that we will judge them. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 13 through 14, those angels, they're going to serve us. All right. Now, the fall of angels, the fall of angels. The fall of angels, they, it happened, we see it two times in the Bible. One, they fell when Satan rebelled against God. That's found at Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12 through 15, and you compare that with Matthew 25, verse 41. Because it says in verse 15 of Isaiah, when Satan fell from heaven, God created hell for him. And then when you look at Matthew 25, 41, God says he prepared hell for the devil and his angels. Thus it shows when Satan fell that time, the angels fell with him when God created hell. The second time they fell is during Noah's flood. That's Genesis chapter 6, verse 1 through 3, 
and verse 13, 2 Peter 2, verses 4 through 5, and Jude chapter 1, verse 6. It says they left their own habitation. They kept not their first estate, and that the angels are in hell in context of Noah's flood. So it shows right here that something happened when they left, uh, when these angels, they left their heavenly estate transformed in, and mingled into an earthly estate. And because of that, they died in Noah's flood, a good number of them. Okay, now let's talk about the rapture, the rapture. Now what is rapture? Rapture, what it means is it means caught up or snatched up. Now there are many <clears throat> different religious people who deny a rapture. They said, there's no such thing as a rapture. And you ask them, well, why is that? Why is there no such thing as a rapture? And their evidence is there's no such word in the Bible, rapture. So see, because rapture is not mentioned in the Bible, that means that rapture is not in the Bible. Well, that's ludicrous because the word Bible is not in your Bible. Does that mean there's no Bible? So that's ridiculous. The word Trinity is not in your Bible. So those kind of arguments are really weak arguments. By the way, the rapture is in the Bible. Now you might say, no, it's not. Well, the thing is this. Rapture is a Latin word you got to understand. It means caught up or snatched up. And that word caught up is found in the Bible. You're going to find that 1 Thessalonians 4, 15 through 18, and 1 Corinthians 15, 49 through 55. Now, the rapture, as we cover its definition, again, it means caught up or snatched up, and that's a Latin word. Thus, you've heard of the raptors, right, when they refer to a Jurassic sense. Why? Because it catches up. These people snatch up their prey. So it came from that Latin word. But the two passages that you're going to mark down, these are very important. If you don't know these verses, then you're not going to know this basic doctrine. The doctrine of the rapture is found in these two passages. And you'll notice in my study, in the audio study, I went through these verses so many times. 1 Corinthians 15, 49 through 55, as well as 1 Thessalonians 4, 15 through 18. The two main passages of the rapture, and you have to remember those. Okay, now how will the rapture happen? That's the first question. How will the rapture happen? Well, how will the rapture happen is that it's going to go off like a cobalt bomb. There's going to be like a flash of light. And that's found in Matthew chapter 24, verse 27. Matthew 24, 27. That is coming, a flash of light like a cobalt bomb goes off. And then uh, also there's a clap of thunder like a hundred nuclear bombs simultaneously. You're going to hear that kind of noise. That's found at 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 16 with... Job chapter 31, verse 1 through 4, as well as John chapter 12, verse 28 through 29. The trumpet sound will also follow the thunder. That's found at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16, 1 Corinthians 15, 52. The dead will be resurrected, so like zombies, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. Now, this is very interesting. Whenever God resurrects the dead, he calls them by name. Why does he do that? So that all the dead don't resurrect. You'll see these cases at Luke 7, 14, Luke 8, 54, and John 11, 43 through 44. You'll notice that he addresses them by name when he resurrects people. Why does he do that? So that all the dead don't accidentally get resurrected. So the thing is, at the rapture, he's going to call your name. That's going to be something. That's going to be something. Uh, this is also proven at John chapter 10, verse 3. John chapter 10, verse 3. The Bible says Jesus calls his sheep out by name. That's what the Bible says. And he calls him to his fold, leads them out by name. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 17. The living will be raptured following the dead. So those who are alive will follow the dead when, during the rapture. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, for, verse 50. There's no blood. Our blood will be left behind when we get raptured. So imagine that, man. I mean, the buddy sitting next to you who's lost, he sees you disappeared with your blood all over the seat. Don't you think he's going to freak out? 
1 Corinthians 15, 49 through 53, that passage says the body will be changed into an immortal and incorruptible state. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17, we're going to meet Jesus and the saints in the clouds first, then we all go to heaven together. That's what's going to happen. We all meet Jesus and the saints in the clouds first, then we all go to heaven together. In 1 Thessalonians 4, 17, with John chapter 20, verse 17 through 20, with Matthew chapter 28, verse 8 through 9, we're going to meet Jesus in the air, then he's taking us to heaven faster than the speed of life. Now, how do, uh, sp faster than the speed of light, excuse me, not life, the speed of light. If it's by life, then that's going to take a while. Now, how do we know this? We know this because in the two passages at John 20 and Matthew 28, when Jesus went to heaven, he went back to earth for his disciples. Then he, t and that time took less than a few hours, you got to understand. So that's what you're going to find out in John 20 and Matthew 28. When Jesus went to heaven, he had to go but down back to earth to meet his disciples again. And that happened within only a few hours. So thus this proves that when we get raptured up to heaven, this is going to be super fast. It's going to be faster than the speed of light. 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 16, Michael the archangel, he's going to be coming down to the earth for the tribulation. That's found at Jude chapter 1 verse 9. Only one archangel is Michael, and Michael is mentioned at the tribulation at Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. Uh, in Luke chapter 12, verse 39 through 40, uh, Jesus will come like a thief snatching. Now remember, rapture means caught up to snatch. So this matches perfectly with Luke chapter 12. All right, the names of the rapture. Now these are very important. Names of the rapture. The rapture has many different names in the Bible. So obviously you're not going to see the word rapture there. Well, what other word you're going to see? Well, in the Bible, it's going to refer to the day of the Lord, 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 1 through 4. It can refer to the day of the Lord, which is in a tribulation sense, obviously, and it can refer to the post-tribulation rapture. It can also refer to the pre-tribulation rapture as 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 2. Day of Christ. Day of Christ is another name. Another name is Blessed Hope. Blessed Hope. That's Titus chapter 2, verse 13. It's also known as the Day of Redemption. Day of Redemption. That's Romans chapter 8, verse 23, and Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. Okay, now, the rapture... When will the rapture happen? Now, that's a big thing on YouTube, actually. When? When will the rapture happen? But this is the basic doctrine, so I'm just going to give you the basics about timing of the rapture. But believe it or not, this is going to be a sufficient amount of information. All right, in Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 10 through 13, Solomon's bride, which is a type of the church, is told by her lover Solomon, who is a type of Christ, that he is coming at spring, springtime. And when you look at Matthew chapter 24, verse 27, and verse 32 through 33 and verse 36, the verse says that Jesus is coming near when the, uh, when the figs start to blossom. So that's close to springtime, see? So we see right here that it seems like that it can occur during the springtime, spring or summertime. Now, in, now fundamentalists, they would like to say that no one knows the timing when Jesus Christ will return. And there are passages to prove it. It's Matthew 24, verse 36, Mark 13, 32, and Luke chapter 12, verse 40 through 41. Now, there are problems with this passage, okay? There are problems with using those passages. The verse says it's the day and hour that you cannot tell, not the times and seasons. Christians do know the times and seasons of God's coming. That's found at 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 1 through 2. But not the day and hour. It's like a woman who's pregnant. You know a time and season for it, but you don't know the exact day and hour she's going to give birth. There are also uh, three, um, four, more uh, four or five arguments that easily demolish these three passages used by Baptists and ignorant Christians who don't know much about the
timing of Jesus Christ. Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 29, and Proverbs chapter 25, verse 2 shows we can know when God is hiding something. That's a noble thing. In, that's the first argument. Second argument, Luke chapter 12, verse 40 through 41. Knowing the timing of the rapture is referred to as a parable. And then Jesus said that the, what he said will no longer be in secret by parables, but openly revealed to Christians. That's found at John chapter 16, verse 25. Another thing is Mark uh, chapter 13, verse 32. Mark chapter 13, verse 32. Another thing is this, is that when you read that passage in Mark 13, 32, it says, son of man, son of man. Why did he say that? Because he's referring to his own humanity. When Jesus refers to himself as son of God, he's referring to himself in his deity nature. But when he says son of man, he's referring to in his human nature. There's no doubt about that throughout the Bible. Now, here's the thing is that when Jesus Christ refers to himself in his human nature, Jesus said in Mark 13, 32, only the fathers know. Only the Father knows the timing, not Jesus Christ himself. Now, obviously, does Jesus Christ not know when he's going to rapture us to heaven? Of course not. He knows when he's going to rapture his children home. So then why would he say in Mark 13, 32, that the Son of Man doesn't know but the Father? Simple. He's referring to human nature. So here's the simple answer. Of our own human ability and power, there's no way we can figure out the timing of the rapture. But with God's word, see, because God knows everything, you can know. See, by the power of God. It's that simple. Here's the fourth argument. The fourth argument against it is that the Bible does show there were men who knew God's timing. Some examples include 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 1 through 3. There are two signs before the rapture, two possible signs, possibly before the rapture. Second Kings chapter two, verse one through three. These people knew the exact day that Elijah would be raptured. Daniel chapter nine, verse twenty-five through twenty-seven. Jesus's first coming was exactly dated. The Messiah's coming was exactly dated. His first coming. First Thessalonians five, verse one through two. Paul knew that the Christians are aware of the time and seasons of Christ's coming. So that's the overall thing. All right, now the pre-tribulation rapture. Pre-tribulation rapture. This is where people scream on top of their lungs. No, 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 there's no such thing. This is a basic doctrine. Everyone knows that the rapture is going to happen before the tribulation. The people who don't know are those who are in different religions and cults. No joke. If you think I'm joking, go to those cults. See if they believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. They don't. Not only that, those are people online. That's why online is infested with that, which is sad. They don't know dispensationalism. Okay, in the pre-tribulation rapture doctrine, this is very important to understand, to understand eschatology. There are four different types of rapture. One is called mid-tribulation. In other words, there's a rapture in the middle of the tribulation. Second, pre-rapture. In other words, a rapture before God's wrath on Armageddon. The third thing is post-tribulation rapture. It's a rapture after the tribulation. And there's a thing called partial rapture. Partial rapture, what it means is that the rapture could happen before the tribulation, and some are left behind to verify their faith. Thus, multiple raptures would occur depending on these people's faiths. So that's called, that's a partial rapture. Now, uh, why do we deny this? We deny this because there's no doubt that there has to be a pre-tribulation rapture. Some arguments to prove this is Revelation chapter 14, verses 9 through 11, compared with John chapter 5, verse 24. What you're going to find out right here is that in this passage, during the tribulation, one must endure uh, excuse me, uh, I don't know why I wrote that. That's pretty wrong right there. Okay, uh, Matthew chapter 24, verse 21 and verse 13. I don't know why I messed up there. Matthew chapter 24, verse 21 and verse 13. The verse says, during the tribulation, one must endure to the end to be saved. Okay, do Christians go to the tribulation to endure to the end to be saved? No, because 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3 through 6 shows that endurance is of works. Endurance is a work. And no Christian is saved by works, according to Ephesians 2, verses 8 through 9. Not only that, Revelation chapter 14, verse 9 through 11, 
with John 5, 24. So there we go. In those passages right there, it says that um, those who take the mark of the beast, they are in danger of God's wrath. But in John 5, 24, it says that we're already passed from God's wrath, passed from death unto life. So thus it shows that we're going to bypass the wrath doomed from the mark of the beast during the tribulation. Another thing is 1 Thessalonians, mm, Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, compared to uh, Revelation chapter 13, verse 7. If you look in those two passages, Jesus Christ says the gates of hell will not prevail against God's church. But in Revelation chapter 13, verse 7, it shows that the beast, the Antichrist, he overcomes, he overpowers the saints of God. Well, there's a contradiction. I thought the church cannot be prevailed by the gates of hell. But Revelation 13, 7 shows that the gates of hell prevails against God's saints. Thus, this shows this is not speaking about the church. Another argument is after Revelation, after Revelation chapter 6, which is the first seal of the tribulation, Revelation 6 and onward, church is not mentioned anywhere at all. Church is not mentioned anywhere at all. Thus, the church is not going to be in the tribulation. Another thing is, uh, Matthew chapter 2, 20, uh, no, we'll cr cross that one out. Uh, Revelation chapter 14, verse 6, with Galatians chapter 1, verse 8, and 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. If you look in those three passages right there, those three passages show that uh, the everlasting gospel is preached, and the everlasting gospel is fearing God. However, if you look at Galatians 1, 8, Paul says, if such an angel, like Revelation 14, 6, gives you a different gospel than what he preached, which is Christ's death, uh, death, burial, and resurrection, then let him be accursed. Well, there's a problem here. Uh, if Revelation 14, 6, that's a legitimate gospel by an angel, but then Galatians 1, Paul said, no, his gospel is legitimate, and if there's an additional gospel, let him be accursed, there's a contradiction, unless you separate those two gospels to different time periods to different groups of people. Thus, it proves that Christians do, cannot be at the everlasting gospel of Revelation 14. Otherwise, we violate Galatians 1.8. So we have to be at a different time period, different group of people. Now, this one, I actually added it. The, the most convincing proof is Matthew 24, 16 through 21, as well as Luke chapter 21, verse 21 through 23. And then verse 34 through 36, and 1 Thessalonians 5, 4 through 9. These three passages are undoubtedly very convincing proof that Jesus and Paul both believe Christians cannot be at the tribulation. They're going to be raptured. How do you know that? Because at the day, we would not be taken unawares, and we're not part of the drunken, and we're also watchful. Based on those three, that's why we're going to escape the Wrath. We're going to escape the tribulation, and we're going to be raptured. There is absolutely no doubt about that if you look at those three passages. All right, the last Bible study is street preaching. So I'm going to wrap this up real briefly for street preaching. So let's put a new section here, street preaching. Street preaching, what does that mean? That basically means preaching on the streets. Simply, That's pretty simple, right? Preaching on the streets. Now, there are people who criticize street preaching, that this is an, an, an uncouth method. You shouldn't be doing that. However, there are several things to disprove this, okay? There are several things to disprove this. So let's cover the criticisms against street preaching. If you look at the book of Proverbs, wisdom crieth aloud in the streets. So this verse plainly says that it's wisdom to actually preach on the streets. That's what it says at the book of Proverbs. Another example is the Lord Jesus Christ at Matthew chapter 5. He preached outside on the mount. Not only that, at the book of Acts, the Bible says that they went publicly and house to house. Not only that, you look at Acts chapter 2, Simon Peter, he was preaching to the whole city outside at Jerusalem. So you see right here that 
uh, there are many evidences in the Bible where they preached out in the streets. Uh, not only that, Jesus Christ, he, he also said at the book of Matthew, excuse me, that he said whatever he says to you, he wants you to preach it on the housetops. So it shows right here that there is a public preaching. There is a preaching toward the streets. The book of Isaiah, uh, the book of Isaiah and Ezekiel, it shows right here, cry aloud and spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet. So thus it shows that shouting aloud, there is something, uh, shouting aloud for the glory of God, there is something perfect about that. There is nothing uncouth, there is nothing unscriptural about that, shouting out loud on top of your lungs when you do street preaching. So street preaching is definitely proven throughout the Bible where it is not criticized, but rather it is approved and that the Lord, he really commends that. Now, Another thing concerning street preaching is that it is, I believe, it is a commandment. So you are sinning if you don't street preach him. That is a matter of fact. Now, of course, there are exceptional cases. Exceptional cases will be such as um, you're in a communist country. You think you can street preach? No, you'll get arrested on the spot. So you have to use wisdom. There are cases and situations when you can't street preach. Another example, uh, you, you start a church in the middle of the woods. You're not in a city. You think you can do street preaching at a country area? No, you're probably just going to preach at the raccoons and the squirrels. Good luck with that. So you see, there are exceptional cases. So I don't want people to misunderstand me if they do not have street preaching in their church. They probably have good reasons to do so. But other than that, you've got to realize this. It is a commandment by God, and you should do it. You should street preach. Now, you might say, why is it, Pastor, that uh, you should street preach? The reason why you should street preach, uh, we're going to look at this verse, because this is definitely proven. So first of all, go to Acts chapter 5, Acts 5. This is very plain, which, what, which is why I believe it's definitely a commandment by God. We're going to look at the book of Acts chapter 5. Now notice what we're going to see at verse 25. Then came one and told them, saying, Behold, the men whom he put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. Then went the captain with the officers and brought them without violence, for they feared the people, lest they should have been stoned. And when they had brought uh, them, they set them before the council. And the high priest asked them, saying, Did not we straightly command you that ye should not teach in this name? And behold, ye have what? Filled Jerusalem with your doctrines. Thus it shows it went throughout publicly throughout the whole city. And intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Now, think about this. These apostles, how did they preach the gospel? If you read from Acts chapter 2 all the way to chapter 5, most of the time you'll notice it's publicly outside. Now, you know what Peter said? This outside street preaching. What did he say? Verse 29, then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to what? Obey God rather than men. That's proof right there that street preaching is obedience to God. Amen. Street preaching is something that you have to do. I believe it is definitely a commandment. Not only that, in the book of Matthew, Jesus Christ said that whatever I tell you, sh uh, cry it aloud on the housetops. So I see that plainly as a command from God. Not only that, Jesus says, go ye into all the world. Preach the gospel to every creature. How are you going to reach the whole world if you're not going to do street preaching? Something to think about. They didn't have technology back then, too. Think about that. They did not have TV, radio back then. So how are they going to reach all the world? They're going to go to people's houses and do soul winning? Or did they do it outside? If you read church history, church history definitely proves the apostles always preached outdoors, outdoors. Another thing is this, is that James chapter 4 is also definite proof. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin, the Bible says. So you've got to understand this, is that the Bible says, therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. In James chapter 4, the Bible says, therefore to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Now, here's the thing. Isn't it a good thing that when you preach on the streets, 
that you get at least 100 people throughout the traffic lights within 30 minutes that heard the gospel, isn't that a good thing? If you fail to do that good thing, according to James, therefore to him that knoweth to do good, so now you know that it's good, but doeth it not, to him it is what? Sin. Thus I see this as, as sinful as well. So it's definitely a commandment. I see street preaching as definitely a commandment by God. So we see right there that the criticisms are answered and that it's a commandment by God. But not only that, we see role models throughout the Bible. Jesus street preached. John the Baptist, he did not have a church building. He street preached. Isaiah, Jeremiah did not have buildings. They street preached. Uh, the disciples, when they went throughout the cities, they street preached. This is, uh, throughout the Bible, we see role models. But the, my favorite passage is Proverbs. I think it's chapter 8. That's my favorite passage. Wisdom cries loud in the streets. So that proves that you are being wise. It's wisdom when you're doing street preaching, when you're yelling outside. Wisdom, not foolishness, not stupidity, like some people would criticize as. It's actually wisdom. All right, your homework assignment will be given at the end of this video. And let's close with a word of prayer. God, my Father, I pray tonight's discipleship has been a blessing to the hearers. Dismiss us now with your blessing. Bless the next Bible study. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Out of all the wrong doctrines that's happening in our day and age at the last days of the church as the apocalypse is coming even closer, the point of all this, friend, is that you won't be even able to grow in knowledge of the truth, in Bible-believing truth, until you get saved first. The most important question you have to ask yourself after watching all this is if you were to die today, are you 100% sure that you're going to go to heaven? Perhaps one of these wrong doctrines have affected you and you had the improper way of salvation. As you have seen before, the way to get saved is very simple. It's only simply salvation by grace alone, without works, through the Lord Jesus Christ in this Christian day and age. If you're not sure that you can go to heaven after you die, it's very simple to get saved. First of all, you have to understand that because of sin, God is a holy God, and He cannot even allow 1% of sin into heaven. So He has to judge sin with a burning hell. So it is very important that you got to realize how serious sin is, and you must repent. You might say, well then, I guess I have to clean up all my sins. I guess I have to go to church. I guess I have to get baptized. I have to, I have to be a good person. No, my friend, good works can never save you. Jesus is God who died, buried, and resurrected so that he can pay all the sins for you. You don't have to pay a single sin for yourself. So all you have to do as a repentant sinner is turn to what he did on the cross alone for your salvation. You might say, well, pastor, I do believe only on what Jesus did on the cross to save me. That's great. Then all you have to do is just say that to the Lord. You might say, well, preacher, I haven't prayed much before in my life. I don't know really how to say it to God. Can you help me out? Sure, you could say it this way. Dear God, I know I'm a sinner. As I repent, I put my faith that Jesus is God and that he died, buried and resurrected so that his blood can wash away my sins. I put my faith in that alone to save me, not my good works. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Congratulations, my friend, if you meant it with all your heart that you put your faith only on what Jesus did on the cross through his blood to save you, then you are saved. It's that simple, my friend. Now, my friend, it is important to grow in Bible-believing truth. You now know the truth. What are you going to do about it? As the apocalypse comes even more closer and Satan's about his, to set up his kingdom even more, there are many souls dying and going to hell, and even many more churches out there who don't know right and wrong doctrine. It is up to you now on what to do. And go to our resources site, 
www.bbcenglish.org and click on the resources link over there and it'll give you everything that you need to grow in grace. The next step of your journey now is up to you. We've done our part giving you this movie. All of it was done for free by the love of the people. God bless you.